but um, feel free to ask questions because I know that you are in good hands today. Um, ask your questions, participate. Um, we have a chat room and use the chat room. So all of them have so much impressive CVs that if I have to tell, tell you about each and every one, so we will still sit here tomorrow morning. But just as a matter of introduction so that you know who is coming from where, I'm going to start with Prof. Um, Tim Hardcastle. Um, he has a PhD. Um, he is a provincial head. He's also uh, the head for trauma and for burns in KwaZulu Natal, one of the provinces in South Africa. He's the head of clinical department and the director for trauma at Nkosi Albert Lutuli um, Central Hospital. And he's involved with um, student training. Uh, Prof, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Then we have, um, we have Dr. Mukunkole. So Dr. Mukunkole is a trauma surgeon um, by profession. Um, he's actually, uh, he started at the University of Lubumbashi and then he came over to South Africa in 2002. And he has been involved in Kailicha District Hospital as a trauma surgeon or medical officer. And um, he's going to bring, bring practical, practical advice from a district hospital. Dr. Mukunkuli, thank you so much and welcome. We appreciate your time. Then we have Dr. Monson. Now, Dr. Monson is also the head of trauma and surgery at the Steve Biku Academic Hospital. He is the department for surgery at the, uh, the department head for surgery at University of Pretoria. Um, doctor, thank you so much. Your valuable inputs are also um, very welcome this afternoon. Then we have um, Dr. Allard. Dr. Allard is also like the Dr. Mukunkole from another country, but we are very fortunate to have both of them in South Africa. So Dr. Allard was born in Luxembourg, but then he came in in 2006, he came over to South Africa. He has been involved from um, a GF Uesta Hospital in, 2000, uh, in the year of 2000, but now he is a trauma surgeon for, at Christian Barnard Memorial Hospital in Cape Town. And then least, but, but, uh, um, last but not least is Chris de Villiers. Now, Chris is a mechanical engineer. Um, Chris is um, the managing director for Sonapi Biomedical, and he has been involved with the development of chest trains since 2002, 2003, 2004. And um, yeah, so, so Chris, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And then coming to our level-headed um, legal person is Dr. Mattia, Dr. Thank you so much for agreeing to, to be part of this um, health professional discussion. But like I said previously, it's always good to have someone. So uh, Dr. Jacques Mathieu is a senior lecturer in the private law. Um, he is a program director for, at the University of Free State for LLB Teaching and Learning and for Varsity College. He's co-editor for the Journal for Judicial juridical science, and is also an advocate at the High Court in Bloemfontein, South Africa. So, Doctor, thank you so much for um, sharing your valuable knowledge and experience also with us. Dr. Allard, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, then, Dr. Allard is going to set the scene for us on this roundtable discussion. Uh, he's just going to, to um, explain to us the role of trauma, and then from there on, feel free to ask your questions, participate. We will follow the program and we will move from the one topic to the next topic. Thank you so much. I'm and over to you, Dr. Dennis. Thank you, Magda. Can you, can you all see? So just to set the scene, um, and this was where I spent uh, the first 11 years professionally. I arrived in 98 in, in Cape Town. Um, and, and since 2000, uh, worked at uh, the GF Jurist Hospital. So, so the township hospital was with a lot of penetrating trauma, where then, as you can see there, this is just a poster that was done after a couple of years, because we, we had the unfortunate situation of seeing per month 
on average, 83 young males mainly with a penetrating injury to the chest, with a stab wound that actually required something like a chest strain because all the lung was injured or there was a lot of bleeding. So when you do that so often and the whole team that, that, that was working there and the students, the visiting students, everybody became an expert. But then we had also our fair share of, uh, of complications of those drains because if you place uh, a thousand drain per, drains per year, uh, you, you would be able to sometimes miss a stab wound to the heart uh, mis, uh, misplaced drain, uh, misplaced drain itself, have a complication, a tension in uh, uh, what to do with the uh, un incompletely drained uh, hemothoraces and so on. So that, that was uh, uh, the baptism of, of fire. Um, and that's why when, uh, and we used, we had underwater bottles, the typical underwater bottle, uh, plastic or uh, glass still often and when Christa Villiers uh, knocked at our door um, around 2005-2006 and uh, the University of Stellenbosch had established an, an, um, an easier uh, valve mechanism to, with a canister as, an, as a chest train device. We were very keen of course to to, to try that. Um, I then also wanted to establish, and, and here you see now a poster, that we created that in 2007. Uh, you see on the photographs that were done by, by Dr. Hofmeyer. he was an intern in those days. He's today a professor already at the Gorteski Hospital. And this was just a poster to, to show the basic uh, instruments and then all the steps. And, and uh, I'm not going to go through these steps. You know all how to insert chest strains, and you, you can find on YouTube very, very good uh, videos that are done. But most important, uh, when you try to go in with your finger to do a finger sweep to make sure that there is some space into which to put your chest strain, um, you must not, you must encounter a space. If you have a lung that is completely stuck, you must abandon and, uh, and check again. And, and at that moment, maybe question if a drain is even needed. So another very important part in the chest drain insertion is how to, how to fix that drain. And there's many different ways. And wherever you're going to sit in the world, you will have learned many different ways. Um, coming from Europe, our Belgian, Belgian University professors, they taught us the way the American uh, universities and how the Americans were, were doing it, which is, was a little bit different from how the South African practice was. Here on the poster you see um, when once the drain is inserted in place, how to properly attach it with, an, with a Greek shoelace and without throwing knots. And the big advantage is then if, if your drain uh, comes out in a couple of days or needs to be uh, moved a little bit or retrieved a little bit, you, you will still have enough enough throw to, to reattach it. So that's little details, but um, this is just, this was a poster that we made and uh, um, uh, by today it's probably all on YouTube. Um, a word on uh, some subject that we're going to debate or, or talk about is also the autotransfusion. Um, and here was a young male, this was later, these photos are here from, from Christian Barnard Hospital, which is a private institution, uh, a worker stabbed at work and you see the stab wound where he has a Foley catheter that was tamponading the bleeding, but by now he was so um, confused and, and um, he was confused and had uh, uh, shock and low blood pressure and, and while the uh, while I was attempting to stop the bleeding with a Foley's catheter, as you can see on the photo, and, uh, um, and our emergency doctor inserted the drain into the left chest. And you see there on the, in the middle on this picture how, how much was in his chest. Now that is three units of blood um, that actually, and you see now how I use just a red blood filter that I plugged onto the Zinapi device 
and then I could l let all these, I had added um, uh, heparin, so um, a thousand units heparin uh, added. If you don't have that, then some citrate. And if you don't have anything, still the blood very freshly running in, in the emergency room and this patient from, from wanting to, to run, to jump off the table, that's how, how, um, how restless he was with a blood pressure of 90 systolic, he then became calm and, uh, and, and was able even to give us consent for his operation. And the operation was, of course, uh, we're gonna go in and, and do a repair of his um, uh, left subclavian artery. I had the vascular surgeon with me. So that's, that is uh, one nice way. The autotransfusion, in all these years, I did it less than 10 times. And we can hear from the other participants how often they, they would uh, do it. Uh, specifically in this young man, would he have given us consent uh, to do this on him? Um, I doubt so. He was uh, actually, if I say busy dying, he was getting so um, uncon. well, he was still conscious, but very, very restless. And he was going towards um, uh, maybe even requiring intubation if we know if somebody loses more and more consciousness then maybe the best thing is to intubate them and to assure ventilation um, um, another very impressive chest trauma case a crushed chest um, in, a, in a young 25 year old woman and you can see here on the on the x-ray a tension pneumothorax uh, from on the right chest and we always say we don't want to see these x-rays because one should have inserted a drain before doing the, the x-ray. Well, the, the x-ray was shot just before I came. In private, I'm not all the time sitting downstairs. And I was just outside the hospital. It took me 15 minutes to get to her. Uh, and our, our front room doctors had already uh, taken the x-ray. And then the, the drain was inserted. And you can see there was so much air. There was, uh, that was an attention pneumothorax because it was a ruptured uh, bronchus. From all these fractures, you see the clavicle broken, and what you can see on the x-ray on the right, you can even see the scapula uh, sitting on the side of the chest. Now that is rare, that is a scapulothoracic dissociation. Um, and that is, um, um, my shoulder expert had seen two such cases of which the first one had died. This woman did then not die, and she, um, she required an, an emergency, so the thoracic surgeon came with and immediately repaired that bronchus. Um, on the, and then, um, of course, the drains had been placed immediately. Now, this was uh, the most difficult drain, and I had placed many, many drains, but this one was uh, by myself placed inadequately. It was still hanging outside the pleura because even the pleura had been uh, detached from the, from the ribs. Um, uh, and, it, and it then required an, a reinsertion of those uh, chest drains uh, after the CT scan was done. Um, I passed the details. There were other complications of, of a, a blood clot sitting in the main uh, pulmonary vein and all that. The, the young girl uh, made it and had then also uh, rib fixation, but that is um, subject for another, for another uh, debate. But, um, Yes, the Zinapi chest drains are being placed. Um, we use, I use them exclusively. Uh, this is the, the emergency room that you can see on top. You can see our, our um, operating theater. But the Zinapi chest drain, um, since I discovered it in 2006 uh, through Chris, uh, I never abandoned them. Uh, unless they were not present, but uh, they are now present every time. And uh, I worked with a colleague and she had still used another, another drain, um, another water bottle drain. And, and, that, and when one of her patients went to the CT scan and the bottle, the bottle was put sideways on the bed, of course the, the air could go back into the chest and uh, that pneumothorax could reaccumulate. Um, which, which is then a, a complication and which needs then an, a new drain. So, and that is a complication with that with the Zinapi drain, you never have the, because it's a valve system. And once the air is out, air or fluid is, is past that uh, valve, it does not uh, come back into the chest. Um, 
voila, this is mainly for, for a debate. So I set the scene. So um, drains are very, very important. Um, uh, having a good technique to insert it and then um, using a device. And, and uh, in my case, it's now 14 years that exclusively I use the Zinapi device. Um, I'm aware that everywhere in the world and should some participants watch from, from the United States, there's um, systems with three components. Um, uh, uh, simpler is, is, is usually better. And uh, a simple valve in a bottle um, with then even still the advantage of seeing somewhere air bubbles. Um, but seeing air bubbles is also not important um, in experienced hands because it is as long as the valve remains straight that there is still um, positive pressure in the chest. Once the, uh, everything is out and the lung is expanded and there's negative pressure uh, uh, reinser reinstalled, then the, the valve will angulate. But um, Chris can also uh, maybe re-explain all that. So that is so far for me to, to set the scene. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I think when I, I look at your theatre and your trauma, uh, Doctor Mukunkole, I think you are so jealous, jealous of that, of that emergency room. <laughs> so going um, going on is that yes, we see the patients in trauma, but but before that, is the patient is now on the scene. There was an accident, there was a emergency, people are just arriving there and this patient needs to be managed before and during transporting the patient to the hospital. Um, Prof Hartcastle, in your experience, can you share some knowledge with us what to do now just after this emergency has happened before the patient reached the trauma unit? Yeah, so the, the question goes around, you know, what can be done at the roadside? And the, the short answer is that it depends on the level of emergency care provider that comes on scene. So the, there's three levels of emergency care in South Africa, basic life support, intermediate life support, and advanced life support. And obviously with severe chest injury, one is hoping that the advanced life support practitioners would be in, in attendance. Uh, but also the intermediate and the advanced life supports uh, have in their skill set currently the ability to perform needle decompression of the chest. Um, in accordance with the ATLS 10th edition, the position has moved in adults from the second intercostal space mid-clav to the same position we would put a chest drain in at, at present, which is the fifth intercostal space laterally. Um, as well, the guys that have the four-year degree, uh, some of them have recently been trained to do what is colloquially known as the finger thoracostomy. Now, it's a term I don't particularly like, simply because you don't just use your finger. You actually need a scalpel, you need a clamp, you need to make a decent hole in the chest and then stick your finger in and decompress. There, there's good evidence that that is another alternative for tension uh, pneumothorax. Again, that doesn't help from hemothorax. And in, in light of today's topic, which is autotransfusion, connecting a chest drain device and draining that blood, preferably into an autotransfusable chest drain set. And there are more than one available, but the Sanapi one is simple and practical, and I find it very useful and have used it for autotransfusion for probably the last 10, 12 years or more. Um, and yeah. Uh, that would be the ideal. Currently, that is not in the scope of practice of our pre-hospital practitioners, and it would have to go through the, the professional board for emergency care and review the literature, uh, and then they may select which, which skill set it would be added to. I suspect that it would be an option to add to the skill set of the helicopter teams. Many of our helicopter teams have a doctor on board, and then the doctor can certainly place that chest tube. Unlike many countries overseas, uh, from the Franco-German background, where they have doctors routinely on ambulances, in South Africa, it's paramedic care. Thank you so much, so much uh, Prof. Is there any other, other doctor that wants to add to what Prof. Hardcastle has said, Dr. Monson? Yeah, 
Uh, I don't know. Yeah, my microphone is on. Thank you. Uh, I think team has just uh, put the things in, in clear perspective. Uh, um, you know, the pre-hospital uh, decompression of the chest is basically for a tension pneumothorax. I don't think in, in, in light of what we're trying to teach our, our emergency uh, providers and, and, the, and the casualty team to put an intercostal drain for a hemothorax in the, in the, in the pre-hospital setting is going to be of a, a spectacular help, um, especially if, if we wanted to save the blood. I think the, uh, I think the issues with autotransfusions will be discussed a little bit later. But um, one thing that I've always said, and, and I think uh, Prof. Uh, Harcastle has just mentioned, is the issue that we've moved the, the positioning of the, the needle, or ATLS has moved the positioning of the needle to the fifth intercostal space. I think that is, is probably going to take a little bit of time for people to, to understand and realize and start, start using it. Uh, in my personal experience, I've had always troubles with the uh, with the needles in the second intercostal space, for many reasons. Some some the most common thing is that the needle then kinks. Uh, once it's inserted, it's just a plastic catheter. There is there is nothing in there, and and it kinks and it doesn't drain the the new motor axe consistently. It decompresses a little bit, but then once the needle kinks, there it goes again and it builds up the, the tension. Um, now. Whether we need to find a device that we can use, like a tiny uh, intercostal drain, like the uh, pneumothorax kits that is provided by by a sister company, Arrow, or something that uh, doesn't kink, is uh, is a, def a different story. But I think just uh, moving the mental frame from second intercostal space to fifth intercostal space will make uh, see a different different uh, results when we do needle decompressions in the field for for tension pneumos. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Mons. Yeah, I agree. Thanks, thanks, Prof. So um, I've got a question that I uh, first want to direct to um, Dr. Mattia as our legal as uh, uh, expert, and then any other doctors and, and, and the panelists are free to also um, comment on this. So this patient is at, arriving now at the trauma center or at your trauma unit, and the patient is unconscious, the patient is um, unable to provide any consent um, for any medical treatment, uh, not even talking about transfusion now, but talking about just informed consent, there's no family members. So Dr. Mattia, in your expert um, opinion, what now? I know, uh, there is this, this uh, uh, act that uh, ethical considerations that we as health professionals need to consider. In your experience, what now? Who has that autonomy to take that decision? Thank you. Um, well, luckily, um, it, well, in terms of the South African law, there is provision made for an entire list of people um, who can give consent or different situations who can give consent to, to uh, the treatment. So uh, in the scenario that you pose where um, a person is unable to give consent um, due to being unconscious or whatever the case may be, um, and somebody else is authorized in writing to give consent on their behalf, you will first need to seek consent from that person. Or if that person is perhaps authorized in terms of any law or court order, they can give consent. Now, I know in an emergency situation, those people might not be readily available. Um, but in, in, in um, that instance, our law also provides that if you, um, uh, well, if it's an emergency situation and um, there's a, the likelihood that the patient might die or there is irreversible damage that can result from, from not treating the patient, then you can proceed with the, um, the treatment. However, um, just linking it specifically to um, blood transfusions. Um, if the, there is some other reason or uh, indication that the patient would not have consented to something like a blood transfusion, and you proceed to give him that blood tra transfusion, you open yourself up to, to liability. Um, I don't know if that answers the question in short um, and whether I should proceed with, with a more comprehensive Thanks, Dr. Mattia. We'll get back to that. Um, okay. Dr. Monson, can you please unmute yourself, Doctor? Apologies. Um, 
you know, for, for, for us, the practitioners, we, we in South Africa, we're talking about doctors now. Interventions that are life-saving, life-saving interventions are protected. Uh, we are protected from performing them. As long as we do them thinking about benefit to the patient. So if something is of the benefit, it's going to be to the benefit of the patient to save the life or prevent the complication from happening. And there is nobody to provide consent. The law and the ethical regulations of the Medical Council allow us to do that intervention as long as we have a limit. So there is a certain limit that you cannot cross. If you've done your intervention, you've saved your patient's life, then you need to seek consent for whatever else comes afterwards. But that's, that's the situation that we have in, in South Africa at the moment. Thank you, Dr. Monson. Prof. Ortkoso? Yeah, just, just to add to that and to, to agree with what uh, Dr. Matthias said, keep in mind that auto-transfusion, you're not giving the patient anything that that hasn't given you because it's the patient's own blood. So it, it falls under a slightly different classification in the law as a blood bank transfusion where you have time to counsel the family, to find out if there's any object, objections, to find out if there's a Jehovah's Witness, which is the, really the, the problem uh, group that don't want blood. But even Jehovah's Witnesses are sometimes willing to accept auto-transfused blood if the system is not disconnected. And we've figured out ways to keep the chest drain connected to the patient, lift it up, and auto-transfuse them. And we've done that once or twice with, with Jehovah's Witnesses, and they've allowed that because the it's as if the blood is still within the vascular system. So, uh, and they certainly with commercial auto-transfusion devices like the hemolytics device, which we use for abdomens and cardiac work, as long as the cycle is not broken, uh, even they will accept that as an auto-transfusion. Thank you very much, Prof. Ortkoso. Good, um, Dr. McIncoli, uh, you are working in a resource care center. And um, I know that you've shared with us previously, uh, there was a weekend where you had 48, um, uh, um, it was a weekend when it was the World Cup Rugby and South Africa has won and it was the end of the, of the financial year, uh, the end of the month and the soccer team has played. And I, I remember you said you had 47 emergencies with chest traumas for that weekend in your unit. So in a case like that, how do you manage chest traumas, being understaffed, being, being under-resourced, but you still have to deliver those, those type of um, quality services to save a patient's life? Okay, thank you, Martha. Uh, as the uh, prof has said, uh, uh, talking about auto-transfusion in an emergency center where patients are intoxicated with a, a decreased level of consciousness, what matters is to save life. So we generally don't seek any, any, any consent. We have first to save life. Once we've stabilized the patient, and if the patient has to go to theater, Generally, patients are brought by friends, not even by family members. So you can't reach any family member. It's just a girlfriend or a friend that brought the patient to you. So what matters at that time is to stabilize the patient. Likely in our unit, talking about our experience, we always have, especially on a weekend, where we expect more trauma to come in. We have a team of eight to 10 doctors working with us. So at that particular time, the whole team of doctors will be standing in recess dealing with those patients. Once we've stabilized those patients, and if they need to go to theater, like uh, if we have a stab heart, then we will have to call the clinical manager to ask for a consent. Then we can proceed with other, other intervention. But when it comes to inserting chest drain or doing an auto-transfusion, we usually don't ask for any consent because we need to save life first. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McConcoli. Dr. Mattia, any comments on this? Um, well, I, I can only comment to say that um, as, as, as Dr. Monson has indicated previously, that there, there are limits to, to 
um, this entire aspect. Um, I mean, I think it's important to understand that, um, yes, it is, the, the idea is there to save lives, etc. But um, when you look, for, look at it from a legal perspective, if you did not move within the parameters of the law, then the law will unfortunately be against you. Now, um, just to, to um, contextualize that a bit, yes, it is true that um, an emergency situation qualifies as what we call a ground of justification. Should a matter be taken um, to court, a doctor be possibly held liable, um, and then the doctor can in court then say, well, I was acting in an emergency situation, hence me not seeking any consent for this and that from my patient. But um, over the years and through case law, established court judgments, it has been established that there are certain requirements that must be met, namely that it must be, intervention must be necessary. Now, I think that speaks for itself. If it's a life-threatening situation or there's a, a, a possibility of serious bodily deformation, something like that, then you will be covered. Um, patient must be unconscious. Um, and then the most important one is that the intervention must not be against the wishes of the patient. Now, I hear what um, uh, Prof. Um, Harcock has said about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses accepting blood even after it has exited the body. Um, but if a patient still refuses in that instance, then you will be acting contrary to the patient's wishes. Um, and then, of, of course, but I, I think that speaks for itself, one must also act in your patient's best interest. At the same time, I, I also think it, it might be worthy to, to mention that in South African law, we do not recognize a professional right to cure um, on behalf of physicians. The position in our law is you always need to obtain um, um, consent. So, um, and, and like I said earlier, if, if there's any kind of indication that a patient would not have consented to, to treatment X, Y, or Z, and a doctor proceeds with that treatment, then they will not be um, covered. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mattia. Dr. Alor, do you want to add something or can I move to the next topic? You can move to the next topic. Great. So, Doctor, my question is directed to you now, Dr. Dennis. Um, being in the private sector, um, we all worldwide are dealing now with COVID-19. And um, in a private sector setting versus a government setting, you have a patient that is coming in um, with a COVID unknown status. How do you handle that situation in your expertise or in your situation? Thank you. Yes, indeed. Every patient is positive until proven otherwise. And so we're going we're gonna to have really PPE um, with the visor and the mask and gloves. And the patient gets a glove, uh, gets a mask. Um, he gets a mask and he gets nasal prongs under the mask. Um, so if I want to examine the mouse, I, re I really now must take off the mask. Um, yeah, so all the patients that came in uh, then got swapped immediately and they are in first line for, for getting, the, getting the result. Uh, and we, we, we take them to the CT scan. So they are considered, but we, if they are conscious, they, they're being uh, asked a questionnaire, a standard questionnaire before doing the test. Um, and then we, we will all hospitalize them in a PUI ward, a yellow ward, patient under investigation, which is then the, the medical ICU where there's a whole, there's a whole ICU that is reserved for the patients where we are awaiting results. And then once they spend the night there, and once we get the result, then they get moved uh, to, the, to the green ICU. Or if they don't need ICU anymore, then they go to the green ward. Um, uh, I always said that the, the lockdown was the best trauma prevention program ever imagined. So we had, uh, we had for a couple of weeks, uh, nothing happening. We had uh, uh, an odd burn patient. The patient got burned while drying at home, uh, which was not forbidden under the law. But um, when you restrain South Africans from moving, we mustn't forget, we, and, and uh, our Professor Buffard had reminded us at the beginning, he said, so far, 
that was right at the beginning of the lockdown so far, uh, COVID has saved lives. There were like 240 something people that were less, that were more alive than in the same period last year. But then, but then everything came. So, so the lockdown was necessary and then the non-alcohol, the, the alcohol, um, uh, regulated uh, regulation that that forbids people from purchasing alcohol uh, has really made an, uh, a big difference of interpersonal violence that said it probably transposed the violence uh, to to be at home and gender based violence apparently increased many fold because now in the in the homes with the unemployed the frustrated the angry uh, angry partners that are now um, Taking their frustration out on their, on their unusually the female partner. So so gender-based violence has increased as we hear. But right at the beginning, the mortuaries were empty, um, and here in the hospital, people were considered positive until the swab result came back. So far, I had not dealt with a positive patient. Thank you very much, Dr. Dennis. Um, Prof. Hortkosel, in, in, in your situation, um, Prof. Uh, Dr. Monson, Dr. McGonkole, in the government, I can I make the assumption that it is exactly the same until the patient is being tested and confirmed, you handle them as if they are positive? It, it, the, the, the specifics might differ slightly. So in my hospital, um, patients who come in uh, who are not symptomatic, so where, where, they, where you screen them and they're not symptomatic or where they're not pyrexial, are treated as potentially positive, but are not put in the PUI ward. So we call them screening patients, not, uh, not PUI. So we, in KZN, we have three separate categories. We have screening patients, so anybody who comes to the hospital for other reasons other than symptoms for COVID. PUIs are the ones who are symptomatic. And then obviously positives are positives. So our PUIs go to a PUI unit. Our patients that are not PUIs but are being screened because they're surgical patients, based on the big Lancet study that was published that showed that patients that have any surgical procedure and turn out to be positive do worse. So we now want to know are they positive or not because it helps us with our um, management prediction. But those, are, those screening patients come to the normal unit, and if they are unfortunately positive, then we move them to the COVID unit. So far, out of the 150 patients or so that have come through my trauma ICU uh, since lockdown, we've only had five positives. So our system seems to, to, to hold water. It's less than 1% of our patients. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Monson? Yes, uh, we, we have actually a quite uh, interesting situation at the University of Pretoria because our, um, our main hospital, the where the trauma unit is situated, doesn't take COVID patients. So we have two hospitals side by side, the old uh, Pretoria Academic Hospital, which is now a district hospital that uh, is, is closest to, to us by a block or so, has been converted into the, uh, into the COVID hospital. But we have similar, the, the setup for the screening and the testing is similar to what uh, team has in KwaZulu-Natal. So if, if a patient comes and is a general surgery patient, needs surgery, gets tested and put in a POI until um, he's, he gets his uh, results. Trauma patients are screened. Uh, if they are conscious, if they are not conscious, they are, they are managed as a positive patient until we can get either a proper screening or a test done. Not everybody gets tested because of resources, stuff like that, but we, we are very cautious of how we protect ourselves and how we handle the, the, the environment. Our nurses are full PPE, the doctors are full PPE, and everybody uh, is aware of the possibility of the patient being a, being a positive patient until we get, the, we get the clear. Thank you very much, Dr. Monson. Just, just, to, just to add to what Monson is saying, patients that come in, for ICU referrals, for example, who are already intubated by the paramedics or coming to us from a different hospital, they get uh, tested with a ETA, endotracheal aspirate, rather than the, than the swab because it's more accurate. And we maintain that intubation until we have the result. Now, we're lucky we're getting our results within 36 hours. So usually by the time the patient is ready for extubation, we have the results most of the time. 
and we can then proceed to extubate once they're once they're the underlying problem has reversed. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, Dr. McConkole, do you want to add something? Yes, as, as um, um, Dennis was saying uh, earlier on, uh, when alcohol ban was lifted in uh, in Kailicha, we had on one weekend 91 trauma cases. The immediate after the alcohol ban was lifted, we had a lot of trauma. And as everybody said, uh, all our trauma patients that come, we treat them as a, as, a, as a positive patient until proven otherwise. But we don't test all of them unless they present with symptom of the screen positive. But on arrival, they are all treated as positive patient, which means that everybody in terms of clinician and nurses, they are on full PPE. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McConkoli. Chris, if I can move to more of a mechanical part now. Uh, the doctor has mentioned using the Sinalpe chest drain. Um, I think when you started with the chest drain, you never thought about adding a, 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 a port for autotransfusion. So how did it come about that you, that you transferred this chest drain into a, having a port for autotransfusion? Thanks, Master. Yes, so um, the initial days, it started in, in uh, Prof. Hardcastle's unit at Tigerberg Hospital, Western Cape, South Africa. Is um, We um, w literally went to doctors, you know, um, our desire from an engineering point of view was to develop a device and, and, and really look at the principles of chest drainage from first principles. In other words, you first look at the functions required. You need a liquid storage holder, you need some form of valve to prevent fluids to go back to the chest. Um, you need to be able to attach the device to low pressure suction. In other words, if the, if the lung would not expand, is how can you, um, you know, improve that? And then, then there were, you know, a couple of monitoring aspects, like, like seeing if you, um, you know, whether they, there's still air draining from the chest. Historically, that, that the way to use that was, um, you know, was, was um, observing for bubbles. And, and then also confirming, especially in a, tra um, a trauma scenario, is whether the chest catheter is inserted correctly. So we initially used the swing of the Schaeffler valve, or now we use the, the suction bulb that, that sits above it. And during that process, Marta, it became apparent that um, uh, they sometimes are the need, or is the need, you know, the, uh, before our device was used, um, the, the normal usage, you know, actually from the early 1900s was an underwater drain, which you would typically fill with sterile water, 500 moles of sterile water, and then the blood would drain into that holder. And that, that was not appropriate for, um, you know, to, to retransfuse uh, the blood. So, so when we saw the need, is, um, you know, the first um, experience we actually had with it with it was from Kiev Uster. Dr. Ollard started use, using it um, initially and also Dr. Lobscher that, that um, is not with us today. He, we have um, um, a sample port in the front of the device and he managed to save a patient's life by draining two liters of blood back to the patient, um, you know, obviously unconscious, you know, it was a life-saving um, um, treatment that he performed and he phoned us and said, look, you know, this, this is possible to do in your product and then you know, after that, we we uh, we asked Dr. You know, Dr. Hardcastle at the time, Professor now, as to also um, you know consider this this, and we added the port to the bottom of the unit. So, so it is today. We the way we produce it is with um, is from a medical grade plastics. The device is 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 assembled in a clean room. We use um, you know the way way that we sterilize it is under the right um, standards. You know, it's, uh, uh, according to ISO 11135. You know, so from our side, we try to be as safe as possible. You know, you we provide a fully sterile product. You know, that that's uh, that's packed and it's legally. Um, the doc doctors are using a product that's legally used in South Africa for auto transfusion. You know, it's the, the standards are different in Europe, for instance, but in South Africa, it's uh, the device is registered and it's they're allowed to legally use it for auto transfusion. So, so that that's um, just the basics, the the back background behind it, Marta, for us. Just to share, it, it is yeah, it's 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 a privilege to to sit with the doctors on this panel, you know, that they really try to 
to save patients and to to make a difference you know to to um you know to act in a south african south african environment you know where where, where chest trauma is obviously some of the highest in the world and it's 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 a, it's a huge privilege to to try and fulfill some of that need in terms of providing a product that that's useful you know so um so we hope to improve it further over the years thank you so much chris um my question is directed to um first it, uh, i would actually like all the doctors to comment on this um so i think we can start at with prof hardcastle then dr monson dr allard and then mcconcoli um the question when i go around visiting our new young trauma doctors is do you add heparin or not and if you do how much uh, i don't routinely add heparin and i haven't had a problem yet and i've used this for auto transfusion probably a, close to 100 times in the last 5 or 6 years um if you're using the blood straight out of the chest most of the time it's defibrinated and it doesn't need heparin if you're using blood so someone presents who had a stab wound yesterday evening and he presents 24 or more hours afterwards and you drain that blood there may be some clots there and in, which, in which case you're giving one international unit per mole of blood so up to a maximum of a thousand because the container is just over a thousand moles and then you insert that uh, through the needle free port mix mix it in and connect your blood giving set and you can safely auto transfuse i must say though um when i when we started this when i was still at tigerberg i think the first one or two we we put heparin in but since then i haven't routinely put heparin in neither neither we at pretoria we just put heparin if the the amount of blood in the bottle exceeds 500 mils and then we do it while we're getting the bottle the, the blood into the bottle but not routinely we addressed it. We I looked into it. Very concerned that I was going to do something something wrong. I discussed it with the blood bank specialists. They advised citrate. Um, I didn't have citrate, so it went in. Uh, even initially, without necessarily always having the proper blood filter, the red blood filter. But uh, that, that uh, but here in private, red blood filter and uh, heparin. Yes. Now, so what what uh, Dr. Alad is talking about is uh, we we have a, a, a little red filter that that takes away uh, fragments of platelets and, and and leukocytes and stuff like that. It doesn't leukodeplete anything, but it helps with the uh, with the microaggregates that will come through in that blood that is in 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 the chest. I don't know if if other countries have similar things. I'm assuming so. Um, but we also yeah, have the American the American Plurovac device has also got the option for um, they call it the atrium I think has also got the option for auto transfusion and uh, and I've I've seen I've seen uh, I've seen auto transfusions given through a standard transfusion set the normal so filter. that's what I use um, if if the filter clots at some point there are micro micro clots inside there you can change put another line and carry on nothing happens the, the filter itself from the from the transfusion set i think is enough to to prevent any microemboli or something in the in the auto transfusion okay um i on in kairich as well we've been using uh, uh auto transfusion for the last uh, 10 years we never had a problem and we never used the uh, heparin in it i think chris you might maybe correct me but i think the synapse bag is made with the uh, polyproline that uh, also prevent from having a uh, clot. So if you do auto transfusion immediately, there is actually no problem. So we've been doing it for the last 10 years. We never had any problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Lord. I would uh, uh, advise also don't transfuse if it's beyond six hours old. If it is a little bit of blood that comes out and it takes a long time to accumulate, don't come back the next day and then uh, uh, and then you find 400 milliliter and then you hang it up again. Sometimes it f you, you feel like doing it. You say, oh, there's this blood. It should go back into the body, but old blood, not so good. But fresh blood, fresh blood always. And then sometimes uh, 
doing it with uh, an amount of 400 milliliter. 400 milliliter, it's not 900 milliliter. Your patient is just starting to be, Ill. well, maybe he's a little bit anxious or not. Well, he's, he lost now 400 milliliter into a chest and uh, I, I, I give that sometimes back as well. Quite immediately talking to the patient, explaining him and the patients do uh, say that they do feel better. Um, after receiving it, they see their blood coming back to them. Okay, right. thanks, Dr. Dennis. So I've got two questions more before we are opening um, for the attendees to ask their questions. The one is directed to Chris, and then we can have a quick discussion around the table with the doctors. And then the last question is going to be directed to, it seems as though we've lost Dr. McCombcoli, he will join us soon again. I think his reception is just. Um, uh, interrupted now. And then Dr. Mattia, there's a question towards you, you as well. Um, and then we'll move over to questions from our, from our attendees. So Chris, my question to you is, um, how is his nobel chest drain then also designed? Now, now the blood has been drained, the auto transfusion has happened. How will health professionals know whether the intrapleural pressures have been regenerated or that the, the air leak has been uh, um, sorted. Right, so Marta, uh, we actually need a, um, a picture of the product. Thanks, Dr. Ollard, for, for showing one um, you know, very early during this presentation. But essentially, our device uh, contains a one-way valve, a mechanical valve, inside a container that, that can contain fluids. And then above the valve is a, is a suction bulb. So this is almost just a bit of an extension of the tube um, that's draining, that, that's um, part of the closed system between the valve and the thoracic space. And what we've, um, you know, so there's two ways of seeing when, when firstly, when an air leak has stopped. The first is observing. This is actually a new way that, that, that we've actually learned from healthcare professionals that they started using with our product. And then we adopted um, that, that into our training material is to um, observe for fluids that accumulate above the Scheffler valve. As soon as you see, as soon as you visibly see or, or visually see fluids accumulating above, above the valve, you're 100% uh, certain and sure that, that, that there's no fluids. Yeah, thank you very much for, for sharing that. So there, that, that's a, um, a picture of how to see that. And the, the second way then is to depress that suction bulb. That's the second technique. So first, first step is, is, is see if you've got fluids above it, then uh, there's no more air leak, um, air draining. And then by depressing the bulb, you now confirm that you've regenerated the negative pressures in the pleural space. So the lungs should be expanded and sitting against the chest wall and, and, and sealing off against the diaphragm. Um, 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 if there's no massive blockage in the tubing. So this, this is a guide, um, you know, the, the right way or the, the confirmation, you know, is still chest x-ray. There are some hospitals that's actually confident enough by observing and look, looking at, at, at pa patient condition you know, without a chest x-ray, but, uh, but, but, but the next step would be to take and check x-ray this. So this, this has become a, um, a fast tracking of, of, of chest drainage, you know, that you could quickly see uh, before, um, you, you know, that you could take patients to chest, uh, to chest x-ray quicker. Um, so, yeah, that, I think, Machta, there's not a lot of time left, so I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Is there any doctor that wants to add on to this? No one. Great. Thank you so much. Dr. Lord. yes. I, I am, I'm comfortable. Uh, removing the chest drain. My last x-ray was good. Uh, the valve is angulating and um, I'm happy to, to remove the, the, the chest drain. And, and if all goes well in that process, uh, um, it happened that sometimes patients get discharged and no repeat x-ray was done. And then I have an x-ray and they come back for follow-up uh, visit for their broken ribs or so. Thanks, doctor. Thank you. So, Dr. Mattia, um, coming back to autologous blood transfusion, children is something or some, some target group that is very close to everyone's heart. So, in a case of blood transfusion or auto transfusion in a child's case, 
what is your recommendations to health professionals? I'm, I'm assuming in terms of, of the legal aspects regarding consent. Yes, please. <laughs> Well, um, in that regard, again, our, our law is clear. Um, if a, a child is above the age of 12 and they can understand the benefits, risks of the um, transfusion, they can consent to it on their own. Um, if not, if they do not fall within those parameters, then um, consent can be obtained from a variety of, of, of sources, including parents, um, the person who's in charge of the hospital, you can even approach the minister and ultimately um, our high court or a children's court. Um, what makes it a bit more um, complex, um, I think on a, a ground level dealing with the patient and the, the parents um, there is when it comes to religious objections to, to blood transfusions. Um, but in, in that regard, I can also indicate that our law has been very clear in that regard. And the position is that uh, Medical treatment cannot be refused to a child based on religious grounds or religious objections unless a medically viable alternative can be produced or suggested. I hope that answered the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Matthias. Prof. Castle. Yeah, just to, to add to that, uh, in terms of the child being resuscitated with trauma patients, it's not the same as other pediatrics. Pediatricians love this thing about a child is not a small adult, but when it comes to trauma, a child is a small adult because the principles of resuscitation are exactly the same. Stop the bleeding, give them blood, and fill up the tank and fix the problems in that order. Um, so autotransfusion is doable. I've done it more than once in, in children. Um, and it's uh, the, the volumes involved, the patient's not going to bleed more out of their blood, uh, their body than what they have. And what they need is blood back to carry oxygen. And the advantage of autotransfused blood is it's fresh, it's warm, and it carries oxygen. Thank you, Prof. Good. I see that all the questions um, has been answered by our panelists during uh, the session. Thank you so much for for attending to those questions. So the way forward from here, those questions and answers will be typed up in a document and it will be distributed to the panelists as well as to the attendees. There's also a recording of this session. If you need the recording, um, please send an email um, to, to the address that Tobias is going to, to share with you in the chat just now. Um, feel free to disseminate this information, I think it was very useful. Um, it was very um, uh, um, uh, topical for us as well. So Prof. Hartcastle, Dr. Monson, um, Dr. Allard and Dr. Mukonkole, um, as medical experts, thank you so much for sharing your time, your expertise and your knowledge with us. We really appreciate it. Um, and stay healthy, stay safe. My God bless all of you as first line um, workers and with all of you, yes, Dr. Allard, <laughs> yeah, so please keep safe. Dr. Mattia, thank you so much for joining us, health professionals, and sharing your legal expertise and your, 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 your knowledge with us. We really uh, appreciate it. We learned a lot from you, so thank you so much. You also keep safe and your family as well, and my God bless you and your family as well. Chris, thank you so much. Um, keep on doing the good work, you and your team, with what you are doing, bringing out these devices that will make the job easier at the front line for our healthcare workers. Thank you so much for the passion that you have for products like these and the passion that you have to make lives better, not only for, for patients, but also for assisting doctors and making it possible for them to save their patients' lives. And to each and every attendee that shared us, we had um, 91 devices that have signed in. We had people that said they are 10 in a room. So, um, yeah, I think we, we had a good audience from all over the world. Thank you so much. I know for some of you, it is now already 9 o'clock at night on a Friday night. So thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Keep well, my God bless you and stay well, goodbye.